Hello everyone, I am Carl Anderson, I am a student at Southern Utah University, and I'm presenting a lecture supplemental to Andrew Misseldine's uh, Abstract Algebra Lectures. I'll link those to the description, they're incredibly good. Um, today's lecture is going to be introducing representation theory. I'm going to be in particular talking about Moschke's theorem. So representation theory takes a very peculiar uh, use or function of homomorphisms. So homomorphisms have the ability to maintain algebraic structure in between sets. What this allows us to do is that if we enjoy something about a certain set, we're able to make certain claims about another set homomorphic to it. In particular, we're going to be looking at representations. So what are we going to define as representation? Well, lucky us, we have a definition that works perfectly well on the board today. So if we let G be a group and let F be either the real numbers or the complex numbers, then a representation of G over F is a homomorphism rho from G to the general linear group uh, of N and a field of R or C for some N. The degree of rho is going to be the integer N. Wonderful. So this kind of uh, representation can really be done uh, arbitrarily many times. One thing we might do is we might have a degree of n and have the integers map onto matrices whose diagonals are all the same integer. So 3 will map onto, for example, the integer 3003. Pretty simple. We might also just simply have a um, map that goes directly to the identity. So um, anything in any group automatically is represented by the single identity 1001. So we can see that we have many different representations we can choose. We want to be a little bit more careful though about which ones we choose, right? We want certain kinds of properties to immediately be evident with our choice. So rather than choosing these, what can we do to ensure that we choose a representation that's going to be especially useful? So one thing we can do is we can work under a certain kind of module. So we're going to define a module. We're going to borrow this word from ring theory, uh, which we don't really need to get into the weeds right now. Suffice to say, a module is going to be a weaker form of a subspace. Um, if we define an FG module as a vector space of F and of uh, group G, such that G cross V um, returns back to the vector space with these following properties. The first property uh, is we can take any member of the group and put it inside the vector space as well. Uh, we are able to do associativity over the members of the group. Uh, there is an identity element. Um, for any kind of scalar in the field, the scalar also has associativity. And finally, there's a distribution property in the multiplication. One really, really cool thing that we were able to do with this, and it's going to be kind of the backbone to our search into Moschke's theorem, is the fact that we can make submodules of these. So a subset W of the vector space V is going to be a submodule if W is a subspace and W also is closed under the group. Um, that is the group members times a uh, vector inside of W will always be in W as well. Uh, an important kind of detail to this is the fact that we can always have the trivial submodule as well as the improper submodule, right? Um, we are able to have V be its own submodule and the identity will always be a submodule within this. Um, if these are the only two submodules, then we're gonna call V an irreducible uh, module. Okay, great. So let's take uh, definition 4.2 and 3.1 and marry them together. So how do we get representations into our FG modules? Well, uh, if we look at 3 and 4.4 here, we're able to see that it takes actually quite a little bit of uh, definition. And I don't mean a little bit in the sense of um, sarcastically. I mean it in the sense of we genuinely only need to define a little bit more. We only need to define multiplication GV by the rule that GV equals a representation rho of G times V. Um, in other words, it's when each element in G equals its representation, uh, in which case we've guaranteed an FG module. So let's go ahead and prove this. So taking a look at this, all we're going to do is essentially add the little rho 
at the start of each of our main clauses here. So what we're now saying is that rho of g times v is in the vector space, which makes total sense. Rho of g, as we've defined, is going to be uh, into the general linear space. And so we got that covered. Likewise here, uh, rho of g and rho of g here are going to all be vectors, so they're going to be close under uh, associativity. Finally, or not finally, excuse me, um, because it's a representation, is a homomorphism, we're able to know that there is an identity, uh, a kernel set uh, of this, such that uh, rho of 1 is just going to simply become 1. Wonderful. And then lastly, for 4 does not really have uh, much to do with rows. It's a scalar thing. And then here we have a distributive property, which also makes sense, right? Rho of G becomes rho of G U and rho of G V. Wonderful. So uh, already pretty quickly, we can see that if we make our group have a representation into the general linear group, then we're able to make an FG module out of it incredibly quickly. Uh, and this gives us some wonderful, juicy things we can do to prove a little bit more and to work within the uh, linear algebra space, right? And so uh, returning back to the idea of homomorphism, the goal is here that if we can make uh, algebraic structures in GL uh, evident, then we're able to start showing things about our group. Now that we've kind of uh, spelled out what a module is, let's return to this idea of a submodule. So one really interesting thing we're able to do is discover what a submodule is by identifying a special FG homomorphism. To back up a little bit, we're going to define an FG homomorphism as a linear transformation that goes from one FG module to another by this certain rule. Uh, we're going to call this a little simple theta here. So theta takes uh, the group element times the vector space uh, to the group element times the uh, theta of that vector space, which is just another way of saying that theta is going to send v to w whenever it sends gv to gw. So what does this allow us to show? Well, let v and w be fg modules and let theta go from v to w um, as an fg homomorphism. Then the kernel of theta is an ab is a fg submodule of v and the image of theta is an FG submodule of W. Into Westing. How do we show this? Well, first note that because theta is a linear transformation, the kernel of theta is going to be already a subspace of V, and the image of theta is going to be a subspace of W. So we got that down. All we need to show is that the previous uh, definition here, or excuse me, not the definition, our addition of multiplication here is going to be uh, also maintained from this transformation. So let V be in the kernel of theta and let G be the element in G. So theta of G V, well, we already know from this definition, goes to G theta V, which because theta, or excuse me, because V is in the kernel of theta, this is just going to go directly to zero. Going directly to zero, this becomes a zero itself. Ah, wonderful. This means that G V is in the kernel of theta. So let W be in the image of theta. This means that there is a V such that theta V is going to be W. So what we have then is that GW simply is G theta of V. Returning back to the major property that we defined in the uh, FG homomorphism, this means it's just theta GV, which again is the image of theta. So the image of theta is also an FG submodule of W. Wonderful. What does this get us to do? What Proposition 7.2 shows us is that there is a connection between submodules and a homomorphism. What we can do then is say that V and W are actually the same group. Say that V is V. Oh, excuse me. Say that W is V. Then what we have is an endomorphism, and what we end up having is that the kernel and the image are both going to be submodules of V. Furthermore, we're going to try to show that there is an excellent property between these two that allows us to say a lot about V, and in, do so, in so doing, allows us to say a lot about the original group we started with. Enter Moschke's theorem. I'm going to skip directly to Moschke's theorem. We're going to need a couple lemmas, though, that I'll come back to. So let G be a finite group, and let F be either the real numbers or the complex numbers, and let V be an FG submodule. Then, if U is an FG submodule of V, 
there exists a FG submodule W of V such that V is going to be the direct sum of U and W. A direct sum meaning that for every vector in V, uh, there is a unique uh, sum a vector of a vector in U and a vector in W that pr produces this. To get this off the ground, we're going to need to borrow two propositions from linear algebra. Proposition 2.29 is going to say, suppose that V is a direct sum of the vector spaces U and W, and let pi be a uh, function, a mapping, excuse me, from V to V by the rule pi of U plus V equals U for all U in U and W in W. Uh, just to break this down a little bit, what it's saying is that pi is going to take the sum of the two unique vectors of a certain V vector and then just give us back the U one. What we're going to say then is that pi is an endomorphism of V and further that the image of pi is going to be U and the kernel of pi is going to be W and that finally pi squared is simply going to be pi. In interest of time, I'm not going to be proving this super directly, uh, but I will kind of sketch out what this proof will be. So first, we can note that because only vectors in U are going to be established from pi, that everything in V that had to do with W will be cut out. So the image of pi is just going to be U. And furthermore, everything in W that we put in pi is simply just going to go straight to zero. Um, if we put the zero vector as w, or excuse me, as u, and then just put a random w here, uh, then there will be no vector to return except the zero vector. So we'll get the null space. Hence, the kernel of pi is going to be w. Finally, as we can see, pi squared simply is just going to be pi of w, u plus w, which equals u, and then pi of u, which is just going to be u. Excellent. Now with those two propositions in our tool belt, we are ready to prove Moschke's theorem. First, we're going to choose a subspace of V, call it W0, such that V is going to be the direct sum of U and W0. It follows that for any V in V, V is going to equal a unique vector U and a unique vector W. And we're going to define phi, <laughs> that's not going to get confusing, phi from V to V, uh, by setting phi of v equal to u. So this is going to be, again, that same kind of pi we saw earlier in proposition 2.29. And so, <laughs> surprise, surprise, by proposition 2.29, phi is a projection uh, of v with kernel w0 and image u. So far, so good. So phi isn't actually going to be the main function we're going to be looking at. We're actually going to use it as kind of a, a helper function for theta here. So theta is going to be, uh, of course, uh, v to v, and we're going to define it in this way. Theta of v is going to be one over the order of the sum of phi of g of v times g inverse. Now, because the main things we added to phi here are just simply g's and a constant order of g, we actually haven't changed much about the image. So theta is going to be an endomorphism of v because phi is an endomorphism of v. And we're going to find that the image of theta is going to be a subset of u. Now to show that theta is an fg homomorphism. Well, let's track what happens to an element x in g. Theta of Vx is going to equal uh, all of this with simply an extra x within the phi. But as g runs over all of the elements of g, we can just make a new element of g by the rule h equals xg. Hence, uh, and there's a quick typo here, let me fix it. Uh, we're going to run through all of the h's now. Hence, theta of Vx is going to be 1 over the uh, order of g times uh, the total sum of h's in g with the following phi vh h inverse x, which is great because aside from this x here, all of this was simply theta. And so we just take this x out and we end up with is, uh, excuse me, theta here of v times x. 
for h and g. Thus, theta is going to be a homomorphism. Using this, we can show that theta of u is just going to be 1 over the order of g times the sum of phi of ug times g inverse. Uh, but, like we said here, phi of ug just is ug. So, it's just the sum of ugg inverse, which, as these cancel out, just becomes 1 over the order of u plus u plus u g many times, which ends up just becoming u. Wonderful. So, let v be in v. Then theta v is also going to be in u. So, theta theta v is simply going to be theta v. Consequently, theta squared equals theta as desired. All we have left is a little bit of housekeeping. Theta is a projection of v to v and also an FG homomorphism. We've also shown that image of theta equals u. Now, instead of w naught, just let u be the kernel of theta. Then w is also going to be an FG submodule uh, and by proposition or by proposition 7.2 which means that V is going to be a direct sum of U and W by proposition 2.32. Uh, in other words, what we're able to show is that FG modules can be direct sums of their submodules. Again, this is a really interesting thing that we're able to do. Uh, if we're interested in studying a single group, we're instead able to study a little bit of linear algebra, and we're able not only just to study a certain module, but a module made up of fundamental building blocks of submodules, uh, which I think is really cool. There's a lot of fascinating things we can do with this, uh, but at this point, I don't know what I'm talking about. So you'll have to wait for the next lecturer to come along and resolve more about representation theory. Uh, of course, again, let me thank uh, Dr. Misseldine for helping me develop this video. Uh, I developed a lot of this off of the textbook Represent representation and character groups. I will link it to this in the description. Uh, and yeah, thank you for your time.